Hi, my name is Emily Helms. I'm the State Range Management Specialist for South Dakota NRCS. Today, we're going to demonstrate how to use the South Dakota grazing tool. This tool is used in conservation planning to help inventory and plan with producers. When we work our way through the tool, it provides the needed steps to implement a prescribed grazing plan. Next, I would like to introduce Mitch, who is one of the presenters on this video. Thanks, Emily. I'm Mitch Faulkner. I'm an area rangeland management specialist with the USDA Natural Resources Conservation Service, and I'm from Belfouche, South Dakota. I work with USDA staff, private landowners, and NRCS partners to utilize the South Dakota grazing tool. It is a comprehensive tool for planning grazing management activities. Next, I'd like to introduce Mark Washacek, who is the primary developer of the South Dakota grazing tool. Yeah, thanks, Mitch. Uh, yeah, I'm Mark Washacek and I'm a retired area resource conservationist from Brookings, South Dakota. I currently work as a consultant to, to USDA and NRCS. I'm in the Agricultural Conservation Experience Services program, it's called ACES. I've been involved in programming the grazing tool since 2002. There have been many changes over the years and with each new version comes improvements. The current version 4.3 allows users to enter their ranch data in three, one of three ways. They can enter it manually, making the tool a simple data entry record and planning tool. The second way to enter your ranch data is to enter it by drawing each field one at a time in web soil survey. It's free and this method allows you to upload ecological site and forage suitability site data to help estimate stocking rates for your ranch. The third method is also free and involves using Google Maps to create a shapefile of your ranch. Shapefiles can then be used in Web Soil Survey to download all the data for all the fields into the grazing tool. This tutorial will show you all of this and more, so let's get started. like to show you is when you open the grazing tool, which right now the version is 4.3, it will take you through uh, some terms that you must agree to. And we'll go in here and it's basically going to say that you accept the responsibility using the program, agree to these terms. And each time you open it, you're going to have to go through that same process. You can open it uh, to web soil. Actually, you open it to a tab in the spreadsheet and it directs you how to get your data out of web soil survey. That's one way. You can open it without adding data and that's if you've got a spreadsheet that has data in it or you're gonna start a new one, you would click open without adding data. We used to have a link to toolkit, uh, an NRCS software program that would kick out a shape file uh, data for you. That link is not there anymore because NRCS doesn't use toolkit. They use a conservation desktop. If we ever get that, I'll put that link in there if we get that figured out. So I'm going to open it without uh, adding data and it always looks for existing data and tells you whether it found it or not. And here there's no field data in this spreadsheet. So that's basically the way you get it open. We do have ability to have a button to save the spreadsheet, to print preview this page or multiple pages of this tab uh, of the spreadsheet. There will be a, a link to a video, this training video that we're doing right here, and we can go to the instructions, and I'm gonna flip over there quickly. And here we have PDFs of complete sets of instructions for various uh, items that you may want to take a closer look at. So I'm going to go back to where I was. Two tabs you will find very helpful are the range field guide and the pasture field guide. These can be printed and taken to the field to record the plant community that best describes the vegetation in the field. To use the sheet, click the MLRA filter button and uncheck any that are currently checked and then select the MLRA where your land is located. Click OK 
and your sites are sorted with their corresponding plant communities, and you can see their representative production values in pounds and AUMs. There's a tab for range fields that lists plant communities for ecological sites, and one for pasture fields that lists forage suitability groups. These are very handy for collecting field information. And there are some brief planning step instructions uh, and the getting started. This is kind of the guts of the of the uh, spreadsheet, how to make it work uh, right here in front of you. But but I just wanted to point it point out uh, those things to you. The normal growth and harvest efficiency. I pointed that out and uh, later we'll use these two buttons up here. I have pre-populated uh, a couple spreadsheets, so I'm going to close this one and actually have the example one open here where I don't have to type in all the data. Basically, I put in uh, the information in the yellow boxes that we need. Uh, a couple of drop downs I can select from here, and I've already done that. So we come down here to actually putting in our information. We're doing a present condition up here at the top, so I have that box checked. Um, I've got listed the percent of normal growth and the harvest efficiency that it's currently calculating. Every time you see a little red triangle in a cell, you can get more information, you can get direction, you can get instruction. So I would ho hover over that to see what it says to help you out in completing the worksheet. So the first thing I'm looking at is the federal and offsite leases. Uh, in this example, I said we have a Fish and Wildlife uh, Service lease, and I put the information in there. Basically, I need to put in how many AUMs, animal unit months, uh, is available from that lease, and what's the current uh, growth curve of that 120 or of that 160 acres. So I've completed that, and it actually calculates out how many uh, animal unit months of grazable forage I would have on that. It's based on the growth curve, which we grow grass based on uh, growth curve one, two, three, and so on, and the mixture of warm and cool season grass. So you're inputting that information and it calculates out when the grass is growing and when it's available to grace. Then we have purchased feeds, and I just put an example, purchased hay from Hayville, and I put the factor in here. How, how did I know it was 2.5? Well, I hovered my mouse over the red triangle and it said all haze is 2.5. So then we get down to the actual uh, data that we're going to put in for the uh, forage inventory. And I put the, a track, you can put a name or a number. I've put a field number, I've typed in the range. All this is just data input. I put in, I made this up upland and lowland and hilly. This is from my own recollection of my ranch, what it's like. Uh, I put the acres in. And uh, at one point, this would be like if someone did a similarity index on my rangeland or a forage suitability score sheet. Uh, I could put that, document that information here. I actually typed in the a animal unit months in each field, and it then, then I en entered the growth curve, uh, which was like I described above, a uh, mixture of the warm and cool season grasses. So I just wanted to show you, you can uh, highlight and you, you can copy, you can drag up if you have a plus sign. I don't ever do it if you're looking at the uh, symbol that has arrows like that on the end of it. That, that would move the cell and that would uh, mess up the spreadsheet. But if you get on the corner and you have a plus like that, you can drag this down. And it's going to change that to one fifth and one sixth. What you want to do there is click on the down arrow here and say copy cells. Then it puts exactly whatever you copied from above. Here, I want to have one field one, two, and three. And so I actually want the series uh, of, of numbers to come in here. So I'm just showing you that so you know how that works. I want range in every one of these. Uh, 
you got to have range or pasture uh, in the land use uh, for it to later on. I'm going to show you how to how it will look up the uh, animal unit months on its own. And if you're going to use that feature, you have to use range or pasture as the land use here. Um, we can add cropland and we, and we can add our hayland hay that we grow on our ranch in here too, but that's not going to give me AU. I'm not going to put in AUMs uh, for that. I'm going to put in basically uh, uh, AU at cropland. I might put in AUMs for aftermath grazing, but uh, hay I would put in tons here, tons per acre. So having said all that, um, I want to I'll just copy this down for uh, purposes of, of explanation. And I'll enter a couple of uh, animal unit months figures in here. And I suppose you're saying, well, how do I know what that is? Well, you may not. And if you don't, then we I'll show you another alternative hybrid method that uh, allows you to get this information from data in the spreadsheet. But here we have manually entered the information. It calculates out how many animal unit months when they're when they're available, and uh, that's basically the manual entry process. I will go on and show you the uh, animal inventory. So I'm going to go over to the animal inventory, and I've already pre-filled most of this out, uh, but I'm going to add just to show you the drop downs in here, and I'm going to add bulls, and there are going to be four of them in this particular case. I'm going to check the boxes whether I'm feeding them in this month or I'm uh, grazing them in this month. And if you have a month, uh, let's say, May, I'm going to feed half the month and graze half the month, then check both boxes. That's about as detailed as it gets. If you're doing uh, feeding the whole month, closer to the whole month, three weeks or whatever, then check feed for the whole month. Uh, but a checkbox in both means half and half. All right, so you need to put a, a check mark in every month to tell the program what you're doing with this livestock type. And when you do that, it gives you a balance down here. Total grazing available. Uh, and over here at this end, it's the grazing shortage or surplus. I'm short 37 AUMs on my grazing. Uh, for as far as the feed goes uh, for the winter time, I'm short 383 AUMs. Why? Because I didn't put any purchased hay or grow any hay on the ranch. And I'll show you what we can do there. Uh, to resolve that issue. So it adds up the total uh, shortages, 420 AUMs. I have a grazing chart in here that really is helpful, I think, to explain that. But let me go through it real quick with you here. The green is grass that's growing. You know, it's a grazable forage produced. So you're, you're producing forage, a little bit of forage in uh, April and then May and June, most of it. This is a uh, I think growth curve two, a little bit in uh, July and less and less as summer goes on. So that's your grazable forage that you're producing. Here's the animal demand. How many AUMs are the livestock eating or need? And it's pretty steady across here. Uh, I think I had bulls come into the pasture in June uh, instead of May. So that's why the little tiny increase here. So that's steady. And then the pink uh, is a shortage or surplus by month. So uh, here's an example I'll use here. We grew a little bit of grass, grazed quite a bit of grass, and so we were actually that month, we had a shortage of uh, the difference between here and here, and that is negative, so it shows it down here. But what's real handy is the cumulative uh, shortage or surplus. And so you can see in this uh, starts in April and starts growing grass. And so then we have a, we end up with a surplus up here, more grass than we've grazed. But as we graze month after month, that surplus declines until we actually uh, have uh, 
a shortage uh, at the end of the season. So we're short on grass. That's what this is really telling us. And uh, so we'll come back and take a look at that. Here's a handy chart about the feed. This is all about forage. Here's one about the feed. Uh, matter of fact, the forage says I'm about 11% below what I need to be on uh, forage. So it does a little calculation there. On feed, uh, this is the total AUMs that I'm short, 383, but it breaks it into whether, if it was hay, it was 153 tons of hay. So I'm going to show you then if I pop back into the forage inventory and, for example, if I buy uh, 160 tons of hay, I was short 153. So this should show I'm now seven tons long on hay. So that's the way that calculation works. And it can tell you basically uh, how many tons of hay uh, are needed for that number of livestock that you got for that period of time that you're feeding them. So that's basically the um, nuts and bolts, you might say, of the forage and animal inventories if you enter all the data manually. So now what I'd like to do is uh, show you the kind of a hybrid method, I'll say. Um, it, we take our manual uh, entries and they would remain the same up through uh, here, the track, field, and land use. But at that point, what we could do, and we could actually put the acres in there at that time too, but at that point, I would not have entered uh, the, the uh, site or the uh, anything in the column here where plant community choices exist. And what I can do now is I can check this box. It says site uh, choices, and I'm going to answer yes. Would you like site names available? So I'm going to say yes. And then it's going to ask me where in South Dakota am I? Well, I'm going to tell it I'm somewhere in 102 MLRA, multi major land resource area, uh, 102A. And I happen to be in Brookings here today. So I'm going to tell it 102A. Tell it where the majority of the land is that you're planning here. And once I tell it that, it's going to delete all this uh, information I put in here if I've already put things in and give me uh, a drop down of actual uh, ecological sites if this is a range field. And it's going to give me forage suitability groups from NRCS's system of classification if it's pasture. So I'm going to fill in here what uh, I had, and I got a um, peek at my sheet here because I'm going to, I had upland and then I had lowland. I'm going to call that loamy overflow is what that site actually would be. This was if you had looked up on web soil survey to see what the uh, uh, majority of the uh, field was as far as the ecological sites. And this one would be loamy. And I'll quickly try to put these in. I had a field that was called wet uh, before, but it's really a sub-irrigated field is the way NRCS classifies it. We had a dry one. Well, that was some uh, sandy ground, so it's sand. So now I have actual uh, ecological sites or forage suitability groups selected. And then here I'm going to check plant community because I want to I want to actually put what plant community is. Would you like plant communities available? Yes. Do you want them sorted high to low? That's uh, click yes or low to high for productivity. I'm going to go low to high. And so I click no and uh, it's just telling me the lowest one will show up on the list here. And then I have a choice to change that. Uh, the lowest productivity, now see it, it, it stuck the productivity here, 0.57 AUMs per acre. Uh, but if I change that to what's really out there in my field one, it changes it to 0.77. So it knows these two things here from the data that NRCS has collected uh, and it inserts that in here for you. So I'm going to put what my fields are predominantly made up of here quickly. And that's a wet 
the subirrigated one and this one. I've got some alfalfa and intermediate in there. And it does the work for you here. So that's great. There is one thing that I wanted to show you uh, about the columns that I forgot to, and I'm going to demonstrate that here. So if you type something in that's a little too wide for the column, you actually can get up here and make an adjustment to the column width. Now, if you get them too wide, the printout isn't going to look very good, but you can adjustments so that you can read things. So I just wanted to point that out as uh, one additional uh, method that you can use to make a, make this uh, look better for yourself. And so then the next thing I wanted to show uh, was that there are two ways to change the basics of the calculations that this performs. And, and that's when it comes to production values. Uh, so I've provided these two ways. Overall production, you can change if you go up to the top and click on the production button. You can change the overall production to high or low or normal. And what this does is it gets it within the range that's probable, and NRCS has come up with these numbers. So if we change this to high, uh, then if we go down here and look, our value here for AUM production was 0.77 before. Now it's 0.95, and it's changed all of them. And so that's the way that works. And it changes your header to high here, so you know you're in the high category. So I'm going to put that back. Uh, I don't think I'll use that too much. The one you might use more is uh, notice the adjusted is always the same as the nor as the uh, AUM production column until you change normal production up here, and I'm going to change it to 80%. So this is looking at, say, you have a severe drought and you're looking at an 80% of normal production. That would change your adjusted to 0.62 in this case from 0.77, and all the calculations are based on that then. And you can do this by field. Uh, you'll see that uh, in a little bit how that works. So I just wanted to show you those two methods to change the basis for production. I'm going to set that back to 100 so we don't. So we use the normal here from now on. And then I'd like to also uh, show you that once you have, you're using the sites lookups and the plant community lookups, then these pink columns uh, become formulas. So let's say that this 1.08 for pasture number two, I have better numbers for that production and it's more like 1.5. Okay, well you can actually type that in. But any changes you make to plant community or site name won't be reflected in the AUM calculation from that point on. It will always be 1.5 because you removed the formula and replaced it with the number 1.5. If you had to put that formula back in, you can copy it from above, bring it down. Now the formula is back. So I just wanted to show you uh, how that works and when you might uh, use that. So let's jump over and take a look at um, our animal inventory I didn't change. So that's still 50 uh, cows and four bulls. So what about our grazing chart? Well, I'm not at, have I don't have as big a deficit now. I got my numbers a little more accurate, you might say, and now my deficit shows up as as less, you know, three percent off on my uh, forage. So that's actually um, the way I would use this if I was trying to do manual data entry. I would use the hybrid method there. Um, so then I want to show you one more thing here quick, and that's, uh, well, what I did was I opened up, let me pop up here, I opened up edit by row uh, for the, um, this is showing me the harvest efficiency and the percent normal growth, and I can change that. It's all set to 100% normal production and harvest efficiency is 25%. 
That's pretty standard without any kind of grazing system. I'm going to put a grazing system on these three pieces of rangeland, and I'm going to rotate through them. Uh, and so, well, what do I put in there? Well, the, oh, excuse me, uh, the harvest efficiency information, 25% season long. I'm going to use 30% grazing rotation once through three or more pastures. So I'm going to use 30% for those three fields. So I've changed that. And I've also added a field of cropland down here, 40 acres, and I put it's 2.1 AUMs per acre that I'm gonna get off of those corn stalks. How did I figure that out? I popped over here in the crop tab, and I put the data for the field in here, the acres, my yield, and it told me that I have 2.1 AUMs uh, estimated that I could harvest from those corn stalks. All right, so I put that field in, and I'm going to graze that in October because the growth curve it doesn't it isn't available till October and November, um, and so that I changed. So I added a few acres. Um, the animal inventory I bumped up five head, uh, and I think I went up one bull, and I changed the grazing i'm going to graze in november for the cows i was feeding okay so those are the things i changed and i want to just take a look at the grazing chart now grazing chart has me coming out almost even as far as a shortage or surplus over the entire year uh, that's about what i wanted to try to figure out can i add those five cows if i add some um, a grazing system and some corn stalks to graze in that system. Now I'm going to show you bringing in a land unit, land unit by land unit by drawing the area of interest. So what I have here is our web soil survey with me focused in on the land units I'm interested in. So I just kind of zoomed to that area. I've got two land units here, and we're going to bring them in to the grazing tool. I'm going to use these two buttons up here. You have two area of interest buttons. One is if you have a perfect rectangular square, and the other is more of a free draw for sort of odd shaped land units, which is usually what we run into around here. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm just going to click on the area of interest button and I'm going to draw this area of interest out. Clicking at every turn of the fence line. And then when I'm done, just double clicking. So it's creating my area of interest. I'm going to go to the blue identify button. I'm going to click within that area of interest. And I'm going to look for that area of interest ID number. That's right here. So I'm going to click on that, highlight it, right click and copy that number. Now I've got a. Brand new grazing tool opened here. I'm going to bring that up. First thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go back and find my web soil survey data South Dakota tab. And I'm going to open that up and click run query. OK, so as soon as that query box opens, I'm going to right click in that box, click paste. Submit my query brings up the data table, with the soil map units, and the ecological site IDs. Clicking Control A highlights all that data. Right click, copy. I'm gonna minimize that. Go back to my grazing tool and just click the Get ES data box. It brings in 
all of that soil survey data and it gives me a message that says a field number is required and that we need to enter in a field number for each of the cells under field. So I'll show you how that's done. I click OK. I'm just going to call this field one. If you have a track number, you can include a track number also. I don't have one. I'm just going to go with field one, but I need to take this and there's a little box in the corner of that cell. I'll hover over it until I get the little plus sign and I'm going to drag that one down through the entire set of data. And I'm going to copy that field one into every line of data. OK, so I've got my field one taken care of. <clears throat> the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go back to my web soil survey. And I'm going to bring in another area of interest, so I'm going to clear this area of interest. And I happen to have another small field that's going to be included in this grazing tool. And it's a little rectangular field right here. And since it, since it is pretty much a perfect rectangle, I'm just going to use this square area of interest and I'm just going to drag it across and release. And I'm going to go through the exact same steps here again. So I'm going to go to the blue identify. Click in the middle of it. Look for my area of interest ID. Copy that number. Bring my grazing tool back. I'm going to go through those steps again. I still have my data from the first polygon in there. Click run query. Click in the query box, right click paste, submit my query. Again, the data table opens, control A, copy it once it's highlighted. I go back to my grazing tool again, and I'm gonna click on get ES data once again. It's going to ask me because data exists from that first polygon do i want to replace it or overwrite it or append it well i want to append it so i want to add it to the existing data so i'm going to click yes to append then it says a field number is required again so i've got to number these fields line by line once again so i'm going to just click ok and there's the start of my data this is going to be field two and I'm going to do exactly as I did before, and I'm going to drag all the way down to the end of the data. Field two. So there I've got two fields. You could do as many fields as you want this way, line by line, polygon by polygon, but I'm going to stop here at two. So that's how we bring in polygons from Web Soil Survey into the grazing tool by drawing them freehand in Web Soil Survey. I'm going to demonstrate how to export shapefiles from Conservation Desktop. Conservation Desktop is a planning software used by NRCS employees to plan, plan for um, programs or any different um, technical assistance needed by a producer. So the first thing, once you open up Conservation Desktop, you want to navigate to the producer that you need to create a grazing plan for. And this is done by opening the case file using the search function up here. I already have my producer open that I want to create a grazing plan for. And the next step, you can either export these plan land units from the case PLU layer or you could go a step further and export them from the practice schedule that has just those specific land units already um, created. So I'm just going to export from the case PLU layer. So all you have to do is using the select tool, draw a box around the land units that you want to export. And then 
in the select feature dialog box, go ahead and make sure to highlight all of those land units. So click on the first one, hold the shift key down and click on the last one to select them all. And if there's one in this group that you don't want to include, all you have to do is hit the control key and then select the one that you don't want and then um, just hit OK. Or, But I, I'm going to include all of them, so I'll just hit control again, select that one, and then hit OK. So now that I have them all selected, you open up the map contents toolbar by selecting this. It's got three lines with three dots. And then make sure that you have the layer that you want to export from highlighted. So it should be blue, otherwise it won't work correctly. And then just right click and hit export selected. Next, name your shapefile something that you can re easily remember. So we'll call this grazing tool and hit export. Then it will go through a quick processing and then it will say shapefile is ready for download and a download shapefile link will appear in that dialog box. So just hit that. And depending on the browser you're using, either it will automatically ask you to save as, like with Google Chrome, or there will be a little pop-up, like with Internet Explorer. So then make sure you navigate to the folder where you can find the shapefile that you're saving, and then go ahead and save it. And next, Mitch will show you how to manipulate the grazing tool shapefile in order to be used with web soil survey. So now that I've exported a shapefile from Conservation Desktop, I can use that shapefile in ArcGIS and add the part name field for use in web soil survey. And I can also modify that shape file if I want to add fields or split fields or delete fields for use in the grazing tool. So all I've done so far is I've gotten into ArcGIS and I've clicked the add data button and I've navigated to the shape file that I brought over from conservation desktop and I'm going to click add and so I'm going to add that shape file. Click close there. So it should add my shape file. I'm going to zoom to that shape file. And there it is. So I want to make some changes to this shape file. And so I'm going to make it a little easier to look at and take the fill out and change the outline. And so this field down here to the south, I want to split that into three pastures. It's only one right now. So Here's how I'm going to do that. I'm going to go up to editor. You got to have the editing option and start editing. And then when I do that, it's going to bring up the editing toolbar. Click on grazing tool. And I'm going to come over here and I'm going to click on create features. Click on grazing tool and it's going to bring down my construction tools. But what I want to do right now is split one using the polygon rectangle circle that would let you add features or add parts to the shape file. But I just really want to split a field. So I'm going to come over here and I'm going to click my select button. I'm going to select that field. And then I'm just going to come right over here to the cut polygon tool and I'm going to split that polygon the way that I want it to represent our planned grazing pastures. The north pasture kind of sits like that. Got one more pasture I want to put into this. Do that again right here. Just kind of split it right through the middle. And there I've split my polygon. So I can attribute these two. So I'm going to click this attributes button. It's going to bring up the attribute table. So right now they're all attributed with the PLU name and the PLU number of the original polygon. 
So I'm going to leave this one south range one, and I'm mostly going to focus on the PLU name. I come over here. I'm going to change this to south range two. And I'm going to change this to south range three. So I've got that polygon edited the way I want it to be edited, and I've got the PLU names as I want them. So I'm just going to go ahead and I'm going to save edits and stop editing. And that's a quick tutorial on how to use your shape file that you exported from Conservation Desktop and bring it into ArcGIS. If you have questions on this, I would suggest that you talk to your area GIS specialist for more. And you can also refer to some of the, the handy how to's that South Dakota NRCS has developed. So I've just modified the shapefile that we exported from Conservation Desktop. And in order to make the shapefile work the way we need it to for the grazing tool in Web Soil Survey, I have to add the part name column into the attribute table for our shapefile. So I want to make sure I can bring up the table of contents and got my grazing tool layer right here that I've modified the way that I want it. And I'm just going to right click on it and I'm going to open the attribute table. Slide that attribute table in and we're going to work with it. Okay, so what we changed when we were working with that shapefile is the PLU name layer, and that's the way we want those named. Um, you have a PLU number in here and you might have some other attributes in there as well, but we want that shape file to have the part name attribute. So I'm just gonna go over here and I'm gonna click on this little, looks like a piece of paper up above, and I can add field here. And um, just one uh, sort of suggestion or hint, um, you do not wanna be editing the shape file when you do this, you wanna be done editing. So it won't work unless you're not editing. So I'm just gonna add it and it needs to be exactly as I type it, part with a capital P and name with a capital N. And then we're going to change this to text in the type and just go ahead and set the, the properties link to 20. I'm going to click OK. OK, so what I want to do here is I want to make the part name the PLU name. And you can do that two different ways. You can go back in and start editing the shape file again, and you can type in each line by line for that polygon what you want the part name to be. If you've already got it named in your attribute table, and I do, I've got the PLU name, that's what I want for part name. You can come over here and you can right click that part name header, header and click field calculator. And when you do that, all you have to do is come down, find your PLU name right here, double click it, and click OK, and it'll carry over that name from the PLU name column. Like I said before, you can manually type these in once you add that part name column, but you have to be editing the polygon in order to do it. So now that we've got that the way we want it, I'm going to close out of here, and I'm going to open up. Web Soil Survey. And I'm going to go in and I'm going to find my shape file. And I'm going to go ahead and zip that.
and I'm going to add it into Web Soil Survey. So that'll just take a couple of clicks to do that. And I'm going to add my AOI from a zip shape file because, in my opinion, it's a lot easier to add those in as a zip shape file instead of one by one. So there it is. My zip shape file. Click set AOI. And there are my polygons that we split up into pastures as we wanted them to work through the grazing tool. And with the part name that we added in the attribute table to the shape file in ArcGIS. I'm going to show you how to create a map of your land units using Google Maps. And this will be the product that we eventually put into Web Soil Survey to get data for the grazing tool. So I'm logged into my Google account and I'm going to click on Google Maps. So right away, it's going to take me to the area where I'm located but I'm gonna click on the menu function here and I'm gonna to go to your places. And I'm gonna come over here to maps and I'm gonna click maps. And what I wanna do there is create a new map. So I'm gonna click create maps and it's gonna zoom me way out. You can either search for your location here to zoom in but I know roughly where we're gonna be working. So I'm gonna kind of zoom in on that area near Rapid City, South Dakota. Since I know where we're working, I'm gonna go ahead and hit the base map layer and I'm gonna turn on the satellite imagery. So that's gonna help me navigate to where I'm going. So when you're navigating, you're either using your mouse to scroll or you can double click, right? Right, you can either use the mouse to scroll or you can zoom in using the zoom button down here. So I'm gonna find my location that I'm interested in. I'm gonna zoom into that area. The next thing I'm going to do is I'm just going to go ahead and I'm going to retitle the map. And then I can rename the layer here. save that so i'm just going to start drawing and i can see the outlines of my land units pretty easily and i'm going to use this button here that's got the two lines with the three dots it says draw a line so i'm just going to start drawing my land units so when i click left click it it says add line or shape and that's what i want to do so I'm just going to start clicking and you get a vertices, click again, and I'm just going to outline the square with clicks at each corner. Finish up there. I can name this. Um, I'm not going to worry about it right now because I'm going to create a new name once we complete this and I'm going to show you how to do that, but I'm just going to go save for that. I'm click that button again and I'm going to add a new line. So I'm just going to go down here to the south. I'm going to 
draw a rectangle. This is my other land unit. I'm just going to hit save again. I'm just going to keep doing that until I have all my land units drawn. I feel like one of the perks of using Google Maps is it has really good imagery. It does. I can see all of the fence lines easily. Okay, so I have all of my polygons drawn the way I want them. If you want to, you can click on these vertices and you can move them or adjust the boundaries, but I think I've got what I need. So the next thing I need to do is in my layer name, I'm gonna click on these three dots. I'm gonna click open data table. And in order for Web Soil Survey to identify the names of these pastures, I'm going to need to add a part name column. Part name is what Web Soil Survey will recognize. So let's go ahead and do that. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to hit this drop down button and I'm going to say, let's insert a column after the description call it part name, this little add new column window pops up. I'm not going to put a space in, but the P and the N are going to be capitalized. So I'm going to leave that as text and I'm going to add. So I'm going to come up here. This north field, the first one is polygon one. I'm going to click in part name and polygon one, I'm going to call that field the north pasture. Polygon two is a hay field that's called north hay. Polygon three is a piece of rangeland 
that's called the dam pasture. It has a big dam in it. This is South Range Unit 1. South Range Unit 2. South Range Unit 3. I think that's how I want it. Can edit these any way you want. And I'm pretty happy with that. Now, I can do whatever I want within this project. I can add more fields. And in fact, I want to add this crop field in because that might be a field that we put into the grazing tool. Zoom in on that thing. And I'm just going to go ahead and I'm going to add a line. I'm going to outline our crop field. I'm just going to click save. Open the data table again. Let's call that the rest, the West crop field. So we've got all of our polygons, our field units drawn, and we've got them attributed the way that we want. Now, what we want to do is we want to get this Google Maps project into a shape file. So the next thing that we're going to do is we're going to take this layer and we're going to export it into a KML. And the way we do that is here's the map name. This is the layer. Go to the map name. I'm going to click on those three dots and I'm going to click export to KML slash KMZ. And I want the entire map and I'm going to click export as KML instead of KMZ. And I'm going to click download. So it's going to ask me where do I want to save that. Let's go to the C drive. Put it in my C drive. You can put it wherever you want to. I've made a folder for this project. I'm going to call this South Dakota. And we'll save it. Okay, so I've saved that as a KML. The next thing that I want to do is I want to convert that KML layer to a shape file. Within the grazing tool instructions, there is a link along with instructions how to do all of this but i'm going to go ahead and i'm going to go to a website gisconvert.com and here is that site first thing i want to do is i want to go come up here to the left and there is a autocad shapefile google earth option i'm going to click that thing it's going to ask me for an input file. That's the KML file that we just created in Google Earth. I'm going to navigate to that thing. There it is, South Dakota land. I'm going to open it. Then there's a drop down here, and we want it to say, Esri shape file, just polyline. I'm going to convert that file. There's a little window that opens in the lower left, and I want to click Save As. And this is a pretty handy feature. So it wants to put that in a zip file, which will work well with Web Soil Survey. I'm going 
call it South Dakota land again and save. All right. That's how we convert our Google Maps land units to a shape file. All right, so the next step that we're going to do is we're going to take the map units that we made in Google Maps and we're going to run them through Web Soil Survey to get soils data to put into the South Dakota grazing tool. I'm currently in the South Dakota grazing tool and I am in a tab Web Soil Survey Data South Dakota. So if my land units are in South Dakota, this is the tab that we're going to use to bring in the data to populate our forage inventory. So there is a link right here to Web Soil Survey. So I'm just going to click on that, hold my function button down and left click to open Web Soil Survey. And I'm going to click Start Web Soil Survey. So it'll bring me to the main menu. Well, what I want to do is I want to import an area of interest. And if you remember when we built our Google Maps layer, when we converted the KML to a shape file, the converter automatically zipped that shape file. So that's pretty handy. So we're going to bring it in from a shape file. You could also file by file bring in that shape file, but it's much easier to do it this way. And this is my preferred way to do it. So I'm going to click choose file from the zip shape file option. I'm going to go find that zip shape file. And I put it in my C drive. Here it is. It was called South Dakota land. I'm going to open it, set my AOI. And there are our land units and that part name column that we added and named. These are the labels, so the, the map labels are there. So it looks like that worked rather well. All right, the next step is I'm going to click this blue identify button. And what we're going to do is we're going to go down here into the map and we're going to click anywhere in those land units. And what I'm looking for is this AOI ID. And it's right here, so I'm going to highlight it, right click it, and I'm going to copy those numbers. I'm going to go back in to our grazing tool. And step two, there's a run query button. I'm going to click that. It's going to bring up a box where it says, please enter your SQL query. I'm going to right click in that box and I'm going to paste that query into the box. And I'm going to click submit query. Brings up a rather large table. And so I need to select this data. And for me, it usually works better to hit my control key and A to select that data and I'm going to right click in that data and select copy. Go back to the grazing tool. I'm going to click get ES data. And there it is. All of the soil survey data from our shape file that we created using Google Maps is loaded into the grazing tool. Okay, so there's one other thing that I want to do before I finish this process up with our South Dakota land. We had one land unit when we were mapping it 
called the North Pasture. This left hand side of the web soil survey data tab is for rangeland. I have one in there that's actually true pasture and it's tame and probably seeded back to alfalfa and intermediate wheatgrass or something like that. So I can account for the productivity of that pasture in a different way. And I'm gonna do that right now. I'm gonna show you how I would handle that. So I'm just gonna go into this north pasture, came in on the range side. I'm just gonna delete that. Because we're gonna bring it in on the other side, which is where we link to forge suitability group data. So I still have my web soil survey open. And here is that north pasture. That's the pasture I'm interested in. So I'm going to go into this suitabilities and limitations for use tab. And ecological site ID is an option along the left side. And then you see down here, there's a little drop down. If we're interested in forage suitability groups, we select forage suitability groups. If we're interested in rangeland, we would select NRCS rangeland or ecological sites options. So I'm gonna click forage suitability groups. And I'm gonna click view rating. Okay, so it's gonna map forage suitability groups. And it's going to give me a soils table down below. And this is for all of those land units. So it's for everything, including all of the rangeland as well. Well, what I'm going to do is I'm gonna copy that data and I'm gonna paste it back in here. And it tells you how to do that in the instructions. So what we're going to do is we're going to do, as it says in step six, highlight the data in the table by selecting the first soil symbol all the way through the 100% at the end. Let me show you how that looks. So here's the map unit symbol. I'm gonna select everything until I see 100% here at the bottom. I'm gonna right click, I'm gonna copy that data. And I'm gonna come in here and where it says map unit symbol and in 20, I'm gonna left click, then I'm gonna right click. And this is important. You wanna match destination formatting in your paste options. I'm gonna left click that icon. It's gonna bring all of that data into the right side of the web soil survey data tab. Now you'll notice with that option, it doesn't automatically populate the field name. And in this case, that's okay. Because I'm only interested in one of those land units being identified as pasture. So if I only go in and I find my North Pasture, which is right here. And I'm going to point out to you where to find this. Um, just kind of a good rule is to, when you're looking at this data, you can find the names here with in all of the information. But I see North Pasture here, and then I see North Pasture at the close of the data. And here are the two soil map units that it brought in for North Pasture. But I want to be sure that I'm in this olive collared cell right here that's where north pasture is and you want to be paying close attention that you're in the right cell but i'm just going to go ahead and i'm going to label this north pasture and so i'll know that's what that is and so when i type that field name in that will identify the north pasture as being something that needs forage suitability group data in the forage inventory I'm just gonna leave all the other fields blank on this right side of the tab for forage suitability group information or pastures. And um, it's only gonna bring in the north pasture. So at this point, I would be ready to come up here and click 
finished on the blue button up on top. So I'm just going to go ahead and do that now. Next, there's a question. Would I like to have all the tools available for the forge suitability groups and the ecological sites? I do. I want that. You don't have to go this route, but we're going to use ecological site and forge suitability group data to determine productivity and stocking rates. Next, it's going to ask me how I want that data arranged within the tab. I usually go with low to high productivity. If you wanted high to low, you could click yes. I'm going to click no because I want that data arranged from low to high. Click OK here. And all of our data has shown up in the Forge Inventory tab based on the field and the ecological site by acres. I'm going to go ahead and expand column C so I can see those field names. There they are. So it'll also show you what the land use is, all range. Here's our north pasture. Since it was in the forage suitability group side, it identifies it as pasture and gives it a forage suitability group name along with forage suitability group plant options. Moving down, I'm going to make sure all of my land units showed up in this thing. And they all appear to be there with one small detail, our crop field shows up as range, which is fine, but we're gonna go ahead and we're just gonna get rid of that. And we're gonna work with that in a little different way. I'm gonna leave the acres in there and I'm just gonna leave that in as west crop. So now we would be ready to work with this forage inventory tab using either information that we have from a inventory or visiting with the producer as to what sort of forage is out there. But this is where we would start changing some of the information within this tab to match what's out there, match our inventory data, and come up with carrying capacity and recommended stocking rates within the grazing tool. So the next step that we're gonna go through is we've already showed you how to incorporate web soil survey data from within the state of South Dakota. We're gonna look at the operations to bring in web soil survey data from outside South Dakota. So there's a tab, Web Soil Survey Data Other. We're going to click on that tab. This is where we're going to bring that data in. But I'm going to go back into Web Soil Survey, and we're going to look at the process to make that happen. Okay, so in many cases, we're going to have land units that aren't going to be within state. And in this case, we're going to bring in some land units across the border in Wyoming over in Crook County. And the best way to do this is to make sure you've got separate shape files. So this shape file could have been done using Google Maps. It could have been done using ArcGIS and can bring a shape file in. But I've got one that's in here for a few land units. And we're going to go get that shape file and bring it in. It's a zip shape file. Just going to open that. And I'm going to set my area of interest. So it just brought in three land units over in Crook County. And we're going to go through this operation a little bit differently. So within South Dakota, we're set up to operate off of an ecological site ID, which allows us to bring data from our ecological site descriptions directly into the grazing tool. In other words, we can select different plant community phases for different ecological sites, and then we can look at productivity levels 
based on those plant communities and assign it with a stocking rate. We don't have that ability for land units that are out of state. So we're going to go up here to the top and we're going to hit Soil Data Explorer tab. And then we're going to come down to Vegetative Productivity. And we have a range production value for a normal year. And that's what I want to choose is a normal year for those soils. We're planning on a normal year. And I'm going to click View Rating. And for the soils that are out there, it's going to bring in a productivity level. So I want to bring that data into our grazing tool. And we're going to do this process just like we did for the forage suitability group information that we brought in. And I'm going to start with that first map unit symbol. And I'm going to highlight all this data in the table until I get clear down to that 100% when I find it. There it is. So I'm going to right click and I'm going to copy. So I'm going to go back to our grazing tool. Okay, so I'm going to come in under map unit symbol, click in that cell, and right click. Again, very important that when you paste, you match destination formatting. Click that. And the data should load in our web soil survey data other tab. There it is. So you'll notice that the field number wasn't populated when we did the copy and paste, but I can see that field number right here. It's track 123R1. So I'm just going to type those in where it allows me to do that. One down here, this is tracked one, two, three, R2. You see that from the subtotals. The last one, track one, two, three, R3. Okay, when you're finished with that process, we're going to click finished. Now, there's a question that's asked. Since there's already data that's existing within the South Dakota grazing tool in our Web Soil Survey Data South Dakota tab, it wants to know whether we want to append this new data, that is, to add it with the existing data or to override the existing data and just include this new data. We want to append that data because we're going to look at all these land units together. So I'm going to say yes to append. and brings me back to the forage tab and here's our formally named pastures for that we developed together in google maps as i go down here are our wyoming range units r1 2 and 3. so they're all here and you'll notice that they all have stocking rates assigned to them based on the productivity of the soils All right, so now that I have all of the data I need from Web Soil Survey in the Web Soil Survey Data tab, of course, click on Finished. And after it goes through that process that we've looked at, brings all that data into the Forage Inventory tab. And now we can start working with this data that's been brought in from Soil Survey. So I'm just gonna start at the top and I'm going to Enter in a client name and address if I have one. And if you want to put your name here, you can. Um, there's a lot of data in here. 
and we'll kind of come back and look at some of it. We're going to have to enter growth curves into our forage inventory data, and there's an explanation for all of those growth curves. Really, it's uh, one through five, depending on rangeland. If you've got a cool season dominated, a mix or a warm season dominated stand out there for those ecological sites. Um, and then it'll give us a summary of our total acres. And this is just going to be adding and updating as we enter data into this tool. But there's a few different places to get some summaries of the data as you populate it. The first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go ahead and I'm just gonna add in some feeds here. This is where we can put in, if we have some federal leases that aren't included here, maybe a forest service lease um, that's not included with the deeded and that we're not planning on, just kind of gives a placeholder for some of those grazing resources. But I'm gonna go down here to feeds. I'm gonna go hay, maybe all hays. And um, this is purchased feeds. And I'm just gonna say, all right, we're gonna go with 100 tons that we've purchased or that we're planning to purchase most years. And it's gonna say AUM conversion factor for those feeds. And so there's a number that we can select from. So 2.5 for all haze, one and a half for silage or if it's grains, 3.7 is the conversion factor to convert it to some AUMs. So it said 2.5 for haze. So I'm gonna put that in there and it's gonna tell me how many animal unit months I have from 100 tons of feed that I bought for this hay. So I'm gonna keep moving down. If you wanna make comments, there's a place to do that, but I'm more interested in just getting this forage inventory. Okay, so here is all of that data um, by either tractor field number or field name, um, gives us our land use type. And we had one pasture in there that came in from our uh, land units that we brought in using a shape file. And we do have in here our cropland. So we had that's going to be crop. It's not going to be rangeland. So I'm just going to clean that up a little bit. And I'm just going to get rid of the range specific data, which would be the land use, the ecological site ID, site ID and the ecological site name. I'm going to delete that right now, but I'm going to keep the acres in there. And um, I'm going to go back up to the top. And you can sort within this forage inventory tab. So I can sort the data by tract and field, which is usually how we sort this, because we want to see all the fields together by land use, by the site ID or the site name or the acres. But I'm going to sort this by the site acres first, because there's something that we can do to kind of speed this up. And so it's going to sort from high to low. And something that happens sometimes. Um, especially when we're working with maybe some smaller land units, is we get these what we call slivers. And they're really, really small pieces of ground that might be mapped to a certain, probably a, a minor part of the map unit. And so we wind up with all these almost insignificant type of acres and so we can get rid of that here if we want now because it's just in especially in larger range units they're just not going to matter much and we don't really want to spend a lot of time going through and so i'm just going to have my cutoff be maybe a half an acre you could have an acre be your cutoff it, it really doesn't matter um, but i'm just going to go ahead and say those are just little slivers i'm going to get rid of them. so i'm just going to highlight them and i'm gonna, going to delete those so we don't have to deal with them later um, and then I'm going to go back to the top. And what I usually do is um, if I've got good inventory data, um, I probably know which pastures might be in a little bit better condition, might have a little higher stocking rate. But um, everything is sorted here based on ecological site ID or ecological site name. And so I'm going to sort by ecological site ID right now. And it is going to bring me all of those similar ecological sites and it's going to group them together. So it's not by field anymore, it's by ecological site ID. So we should have a corresponding ecological site name that's the same. So um, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to look at the plant community phases because it's bringing in 
stocking rates based on plant community phase. And when I brought this data in from the Web Soil Survey data tab, I told the tool that I wanted to sort it from low to high. So I want it to automatically populate the low value. Now, from this ecological site, I have four different ecological site plant community phases to choose from, with Kentucky bluegrass sedge being the lowest productive and blue stem wheatgrass needlegrass being the highest. So I'm going to say, well, I think that the productivity in here is probably somewhere in the middle. So you can see that change to a 0.78. I'm going to go to the next one. 0.78. So it is actually bringing in those productivity values as a stocking rate here, and it's automatically populating a growth curve. We talked about those up above. And so that growth curve must be populated before this AUM data will be added to our forage balance. The next you can see non-site. So in Western South Dakota, we have a lot of slick spots, clay pans and the like, and some of those slick spots are mapped as a non-site. Badlands, things like rock outcrop might be. It's good to know what you're dealing with there. And usually here we're dealing with slick spots. So I can either give that a zero I don't think there's any productivity on there, but I'm going to give it a really low value. So I'm going to give all those non sites uh, 0.07. And then usually those slick spots only grow vegetation really early in the year. I'm going to give them a one because they kind of dry out and burn up. All right, so I'm just going to keep doing this process. Got all my loamy 16 to 18s, my clay 16 to 18s here. And if I want to make them all the same, this is a really easy way to do it. I'm going to go and I'm going to click the first two. I want them to be the Western Wheatgrass, Bluegrass Annuals Plant Community Phase. Got two of them the same. I can take that. Once I have two populated the way I want them, I can drag it down and make them all the same. Or if my inventory data says that these pastures are different, I can do them pasture by pasture too. But this is a quick way to do it. So I'm going to show you this way. Same with the clay 16 to 18s. I want that to be a Western wheatgrass, blue grama plant community phase. Kind of something that's somewhat productive, but not as productive as it probably could be. I'm gonna go in there and I'm gonna click and drag. You can see how all of the growth curves are automatically updated. I've got a shallow dense clay here. It's only two plant community phases for that. I'm going to make it just the wheatgrass plant community phase, the shallow dense clay. And I'm just going to click them all. Shallow loamy. I'm going to pick a plant community phase for that ecological site. Got a few clay overflows in there from our 60A. Can make those the same. Just keep going down the list until I'm done. And then lastly, here's our pasture field. It won't be plant community phases from the ecological site descriptions. Instead, it will be forage types from our forage suitability groups. So I can pick which 
it's the best. And we will get a corresponding stocking rate. Make sure I have all of that in there. And then for the crop field. So there's a crop tab that you can click on to help calculate crop aftermath or cover crop values for productivity and convert them to an AUM. So we're just gonna do a simple sort of example of how that might work. So this is not linked to the forage inventory. It's just a calculating tool. So I'm gonna say that I have some oats and it asks to enter a yield if the stubble is grazed. So we're just gonna say we're gonna turn out there a little bit. We're gonna to try to get some grazing off this, these oats. I'm gonna say that the yield is about 50 bushels per acre. So it's gonna estimate about a 0.35 AUMs per acre stocking rate, which is about a 26 AUMs. Um, and so this is the number we're looking for. We're going to get about 26 or 0.4 AUMs per acre of grazing off of that. So we're going to go back into the forage inventory tab. And I don't really worry too much about all the different soil types that are out there on the crop because it's usually they're pretty uniform. And they are in this case. So there's 62 acres of soil that we got there. So 0.4. going to be my stocking rate. Now you have to enter in a value for the growth curve. So I'm going to come up here. Crop aftermath is a seven. And so what it's saying is it's probably going to be at the end of the season. Um, when you harvest that, you can change that if you want to. Um, these yellow cells are editable. So really we're going to have that aftermath available probably sometime even in July after those uh, oats are harvested. But I'm just gonna go ahead and I'm gonna say, you know what, we might not get into this till later. So I'm gonna go ahead and make that the growth curve for crop aftermath, which is a seven. And once again, To highlight two of those cells, you can drag them down, make it a little quicker. So I've kind of got the forage inventory how I want it. Um, the other thing that we can do here is if you want to tinker with these a little bit, you can always change this data or leave it the same. It doesn't matter. Um, and you can resort these anytime you want. So I'm going to sort them back to uh, track and field and, and field number. So there it is. I've completed this. Um, it's pretty fast and easy. One thing that is pretty handy that I would show you is you can here go ahead and see the AUMs by field. And so it'll actually calculate that for you. The AUM per acre for each field and the total AUMs. So I've just pretty quickly and really pretty automatically, I didn't add any of my own inventory data in there. I just made some assumptions and my some of my best uh, professional guesses based on the plant community phases uh, completed the forage inventory. So since I finished the forage inventory and I have all of the hay and grassland productivity that I want in that tab, I'm going to come over to the animal inventory tab. So this is usually the next step in the process of creating the grazing tool. So 
the way to look at this is this is kind of the big picture analysis or evaluation of what we're planning to do within this grazing tool or on this ranch and um, comparing it to forage and the feed that we've got to what kinds and amounts of animals um, we're going to plan to get through for the year. So this is a, a whole year process usually. It doesn't have to be, but that's how we're going to kind of look at it. And so um, I'm just going to start filling this out. And the first thing it asks for is the animal kind. So I'm just going to say I got some 1,200 pound cows out there. So I'm going to start with about 125 head, 1,200 pound cows. Um, and so there are a lot of different animal types that you can choose from in here. And most of it are things that we're going to see throughout the Western United States. Um, so we've kind of got all that taken care of, but it doesn't have to be that way. We can create our own animal kind. And the thing that matters is the animal unit equivalence. You know, do we have the animal unit equivalent that we want? And um, we can do whatever we want. So there's an edit livestock types and animals, animal units tab. And this is how that's done. So I'm going to click that button. And it's going gonna, it's gonna to list all of our animal unit equivalents for the different livestock types that are automatically incorporated into the tool. Now, let's say that I have, um, let's call it a South Dakota range cow. That's a, I think that's my, my really uh, easy doing, take care of herself, efficient South Dakota range cow. So I'm going to say, well, I want that to be a 1.05. So I've just made my own uh, livestock type. You can make multiple livestock types if you want or edit these numbers. Uh, the yellow will allow you to edit, but I'm just going to go ahead and just go with that and click here to complete my edits. And once I've done that, I'm not going to use this new animal kind that I created, but there's my South Dakota range cow right there. So and her animal unit that I developed. So I'm not gonna use that though. I'm just gonna go ahead and I'm gonna stick with these canned animal kinds. And then we're gonna throw some yearlings in there. It's a 0.8 animal unit equivalent. We're gonna go with about 80 head there. And then I'm gonna put some bulls in here too. And uh, find my mature bull. And let's just say we're gonna put six out there. Okay, so the next thing is I wanna come over here and uh, I want to start clicking these boxes. So we've got by month, either we're going to graze or we're going to feed. So this is where the feed and forage balance comes into play. So let me show you how this works. So for this cow herd, I'm going to say, you know what? Most of their requirements are going to probably be out doing some winter grazing, but we're just planning on pretty much putting them on full feed for a few months, at least in the winter time. And so in January, they're going to be on feed. So it's going to start calculating their feed demand. And this is going to be fed hay. So I'm just going to say uh, March they'll feed, April they'll be fed. In May, we're starting to get our grass growing here in South Dakota. So we're going to go graze there. June, they're going to be out on pasture, graze. And then we're going to graze pretty much clear through October. Maybe they're going to graze some in November, but I'm going to say, you know what, I'm going to kind of plan to mostly provide feed to them for what their intake requirements are. So yearlings, we're not going to bring those things in until May. So these are going to come in in May and we're going to have yearlings out there. Let's say we're going to keep them out there all summer. And usually they're gone by sometime in September. We'll go ahead and we'll just say, hey, we need to allocate for September on those yearlings too. And then the bulls. So we're going to throw the bulls a little bit of hay, but for the most part, they're going to be grazing and being fed hay. They're going to need to go out there and get some forage in the wintertime too. So we're going to say clear through April, we're going to be expecting to throw them some hay and then really the grass is going to start growing and then they're going to be out with the cows in the summertime or back in the bull pasture. And uh, mostly, being grazed at that time and then probably start throwing them a little bit of hay in November. And uh, but they're going to be winter grazing and being fed. So as you saw, as I clicked all these boxes, we started to see a lot of numbers populate down below. And I'm not going to go through these numbers. These are kind of a lot of the computations. Um, it'll give you some ideas by month, but 
really the important thing here is the forage balance summary. So it's going to tell us for those numbers, do we have a feed and forage balance? And um, it's shown here that we're a little bit short on feed. Um, it tells us here, this is the forage balance summary, total grazing available. This is the demand. So we're pretty close on the grazing. This is the total feed or what we say we're going to need to feed out there. And that's where we're short. We're about 637 AUM short. And this is both feed and forage combined. So we're looking like we're a little bit slim there. So we can go up here and we can start playing with these numbers a little bit and say, holy cow, how many tons of hay would I have to buy? You know, I did produce a little bit of hay down here. Um, so we didn't put that into the tool. We just left that hay as range. So this should actually be hay ground that we are producing. So let's go ahead and let's change this because we just put that in as forage. So I'm going to delete that data. I'm going to delete this data. And this is how we would handle hay ground is we would need to tell the tool how many tons per acre do we have. And so I'm going to take a look at this and say, you know what, I'm thinking maybe we could count on two tons per acre on this hay ground. And right here, harvested feeds, this is going to come right off of our tool. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to put that in as, hey, we're not going to graze any of that. And once again, the AUM conversion factor, I hover over the little red triangle in that cell and it reminds me 2.5 for all hays. And then, as always, even with haze, I need a growth curve. So I'm just going to say it's a one. All of our haze here are mostly cool season, almost always. And whether or not we get a second cutting here or not, who knows? Usually we can count on one. But um, I'm going to go back in and see how that changed things. So now that's allocated to feed. That looks a lot better. So, wow, we've got uh, almost a, a balance there. We've got a little overage here, 204 um, AUMs over on the grazing. That's about within that 20% range, but we might be a little bit over on the grazing side. But uh, we've got nearly a perfect balance, only a 28 AUM deficit for both feed and forage. So that helps you analyze, at least from a planning standpoint, uh, uh, how you might be doing with what you've got planned to do on the operation and what you've got for resources. Now that I've finished the forage inventory and the animal inventory tabs in the grazing tool, I'm ready to move on. And generally, the next step is developing a grazing schedule or what we call the grazing plan often and um, i'm going to go in here and i'm just going to go through each one of these grazing schedule options there's basically four different options within the grazing tool for a grazing schedule and i'm going to come over here and i'm going to start with the south dakota cpa 15 grazing plan design tab it's just a couple tabs over to the right from the forage inventory and I'm going to open that up. All right, so this is what the blank grazing plan design worksheet looks like. It used to be called the grazing time control worksheet, but essentially what this worksheet is designed to do is to evaluate pastures that are going to be in a rotation together based on desired rest periods with a minimum and maximum rest period. And as you remember in the grazing tool, most always the editable or those cells that require entry of data are yellow. And so this is asking us desired rest period with a minimum and maximum. So we're gonna set that. One of the other things that you should know about this tab is that it's designed mostly for pastures that are even sized or of an even carrying capacity. 
And it seems to work best when you have numerous pastures and rotations. It's probably more of a management intensive type system that you're looking at. And this grazing plan is more of a guide for minimum grazing periods and maximum grazing periods. And I'm just gonna go through this as I populate it and explain some of these cells and columns. So as usual, there is an instructions box that shows up when you hover over this cell with the red triangle in the corner and it'll give you some hints on how to use this tab but first things first you want to hit the make list button when it's an option on the grazing schedules and so i'm just going to hit make list and it's going to bring in all of the pastures that we have in this grazing tool, the forage inventory tab so far. And so it brings them in in kind of a, a random order, but we're going to play with it a little bit. So it brought in tract one, two, three, R1, two, and three, and those are our Wyoming fields. Well, we're just going to work with the South Dakota side right now. So I'm going to delete those pastures out of here. I'm just going to hover over them and I'm going to click the delete key. And so that gets rid of them. If I wanted to add them back in, I can just go back to this drop down and there they are. I could add them back in, but I don't want to do that. So for this tab, it doesn't really matter what order you have those pastures and you can put them in the order that you want to graze them if you want, it might be a little bit more organized. But if I'm going to have these pastures all sort of in a rotation, where in especially this is where you're going to be potentially doing multiple times through rotation, you know, intense management, two or three, maybe more times through. But I can change the order of these. Um, if I wanna order them from north to south, just so I can have that in my mind of how that works, um, I can do that. And I'm just gonna go ahead and put those in there. And that pretty much, solves that problem. So it'll bring in those field acres and the total number of AUMs available as computed by the forage inventory tab. And then it automatically assigns each one of those pastures a paddock grazing factor. And so this is kind of a relative uh, factor that compares the AUMs in each pasture to the average of all the pastures that we're working with. So those with a small number of AUMs available are going to have a small paddock grazing factor and those with a, uh, a larger carrying capacity uh, such as this one here field two is going to have a larger paddock factor. So it's just relative. For this form you know usually those are going to be pretty close to each other. They're mostly going to hover around one. So the first thing it asks me for is what kind of animals are we grazing? And so I'm just gonna go ahead here and I'm gonna say, well, we're gonna graze 1200 pound cows and it's gonna ask for a number of animals here and we're gonna need to include that. And um, I'm gonna go ahead and I'm just gonna put in, we're gonna graze about, oh, let's say 125 cows. And then you can add another type of animal if you'd like. So if you were grazing different classes of livestock, maybe you wanted to add some sheep in there, um, you can throw some sheep in there too. Maybe I got 20 head of sheep in there. And it'll calculate uh, both of those livestock grazing demands. Now, here's the important part, it's gonna, ask us to enter a minimum number of days each pasture will be rested between grazing events. It's going to suggest usually around 30 days during fast plant growth. So let's go ahead and we'll just put 30 days there. Click on that cell. And then what is our maximum rest period in 90 days during slow plant growth? Well, this is pretty intensive and we're going to go 50 days is the maximum we want. So as I populate those, it's going to suggest a minimum grazing period and a maximum grazing period for each of those pastures to achieve the minimum rest period of 30 days or the maximum rest period of 50 days during slow growth. So this is just a guide 
of how many days you might be in each of those pastures in rotation with each other to achieve those rest days. And so there's some other information here that's kind of important. So it gives us some averages and the minimum grazing period on average, the maximum grazing period on average, the stocking rate. But then here is the total number of months that we can graze that pasture most likely given the animal demand that we put in here for the number and kind of livestock and the AUMs calculated from the forage inventory tab. So as usual, there's a place to add notes. If you wanna add some notes in there, um, maybe something to consider or important guidelines for the prescribed grazing plan, you can do that here editable and then also just to wrap up this is just a guideline for more management intensive grazing systems um, usually where we have numerous pastures of fairly even size or even carrying capacity and it serves as a guideline all right I'm going to move on to the next tab in the grazing tool and that's what we call the weekly scheduler and it looks like there's a lot going on in this tab, but once I go through it, I think you'll find that it's relatively simple to use. And this is probably the most widely used grazing schedule tab in the grazing tool here in South Dakota. Um, it schedules grazing use by week. So this is probably a little bit better for those larger range units, um, deferred rotation type grazing management schedules work really well in this. And um, you know it's going to allocate forage by the week, so it's a little coarser look at the carrying capacity and the uh, forage and feed balance for these pastures. But I'm just going to go through it, and I'm just going to show you again. Uh, you can hover over the instructions button or cell here, and it'll give you some hints for completing this tab. But I'm going to do like I always do, and make list right away so you need to bring those fields in so you have to push the make list button first and when i do it's going to bring in those pastures and one of the things you can do here is you can kind of change the width of those cells so if they're a little bit tight you can go ahead and pull those a little bit by just getting this line next to the column and go ahead and expand it so now i can see those a little bit better well in this schedule i want the pastures to be in the sequence that i want them and once again i'm not going to work with those wyoming fields i'm going to get rid of those this is just what we're doing here on the south dakota side and uh, i'll go ahead and i'll show you that map again this was the map that we made uh, when we were working in ArcGIS and Google Maps, our pastures. So we kind of started with that north pasture, north hay dam pasture. We have a crop aftermath field over here. And then we have our, our three range units down here, our three range pastures um, that we're gonna be including in this plan. So that's kind of the layout of this thing. North pasture, I believe we said that was a tame cool season pasture, probably graze that thing in the spring first every year. So keep that in mind. So. We're going to start with a 2021 schedule so i'm going to put 21 in each of these some folks will just put year one two or three but uh, i'm going to go with the actual year 2021 and i think we're going to be working with these six pastures and then i'm going to go ahead and i'm going to click in this cell and you get the drop down button and you can put those pastures in there in the order that you want them because this is going to be a time sequence thing You'll see that as we work through it. So I'm gonna start with that north pasture because that's what we're going to graze first. And I'm gonna move down to the dam pasture. It's gonna get grazed next. Then we're gonna go range one, two, and three. They're there in order and there's our crop aftermath. We're gonna graze that at the very end of the season, we've decided. Okay, so I've got my pastures in there, brings in the acres and the available AUMs from the forage inventory. Um, it's gonna ask me here, I can either build a herd or I can enter in an animal type. So if I've got just 
the cows or say I have yearlings in here, I can just enter those things in. But actually what I've got here is sort of a combination. I'm gonna have some bulls in there too. If I had a whole combination of animals, say I had some sheep in there too, or I had some uh, replacements in there, you know, I, I could do whatever I want as far as that herd is concerned and really make a composite of different animals, different classes of livestock, and it's going to consider their demand on forage. So I'm gonna click this build a herd button and do that just like this. And so it's gonna bring me into build a herd. So I've got herd one, herd two, herd three, herd four. I can have multiple herds in here. And I'm just gonna have one herd for simplicity's sake. And when I click, in this blue cell it's going to give me the drop down box again so then i can go in and i can actually choose from all of those livestock classes and i can make whatever herd i want so 1200 pound cow say i have about 120 of them and i'm going to have bulls in there for some of the year they might not be in there for the entire season obviously but i want to account for them and um, I'm just gonna go ahead and add some bowls into this thing. And I'm just gonna put the feed in there. And so there's my herd. And so it's gonna give me a number right here. I have 128 animals. And the bulls have a higher animal unit equivalent than the 1200 pound cows do because they consume more forage. So what it calculates in this grazing tool is sort of a composite or a weighted average animal unit equivalent of 1.16 based on the number of each of those class of livestock. So I'm gonna show you why that's important. So what I wanna focus on right now is it's gonna be 128 for herd one. That's our number. So I'm gonna hit the return button. It's gonna take me back into that grazing tool and their herd one shows up. I still have the option to use all of the customized animals, but I'm gonna put herd one in there and I'm gonna put 128 because that's the total number of animals and it's gonna, going to calculate demand based on that 1.16 animal unit equivalent. I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna like herd one again. And then when I do that twice, it's gonna let me just drag from the corner down through the cells for herd one. 128, I can just do that like that. And there I have my herd one in there. So this build a herd option is really pretty handy and you can use that in a whole bunch of different ways. Okay, so the next thing I'm gonna do here, there's a chart year cell. It's gonna have a drop down button. And if I've got a number over here in the year column, it's gonna allow me to choose that chart year. So I'm gonna choose that chart year. And you're gonna notice that you're gonna see these green bars show up. And there's a text here that says North Pasture. So you see 100% of the AUMs are available. And I'm gonna show you how to use this and how to kind of watch this thing move through time okay so you can see the months across the top of the spreadsheet here it's a full year of grazing you can plan on this thing so it starts with april which is when our growing season begins and and it goes through march which is the last month of what we consider to be mostly the dormant period here in south dakota so let's say that I want to start grazing in the middle of May. See, you know, people tend to start grazing about then in some cases. And so what you can do here is you're going to need to enter in the numbers one through six most often. And you can see here there is one through six with different color blocks below them. So you can have different herds in this grazing schedule. It can be represented by different numbers. So if I enter a one on the first day about the middle of May that I wanna start grazing, it's gonna turn that cell yellow. If I were to enter a two, it's gonna make it blue. That herd one is gonna be represented by yellow. So each time I put a one into one of those cells, 
next to the north pasture, it's going to calculate the AUMs used for that 128 head of livestock. And I know we're probably not going to have the bulls out there at that time, but I'm just going to, for simplicity's sake, um, just keep herd one together. It's only eight head of bulls. Um, usually you can sort those out if you want to, um, but I'm not going to do that today. So I'm just going to keep putting ones in. And as you can see, the green bar over here starts to drop down and we can see the AUMs that are available and the AUMs that are used. So I've got 120 AUMs available. I've already used in those three weeks, 103 AUMs. And there I go, I went over by about 18 AUMs and it turned the cell red. And so it says, hey, you kind of overdid it here. Um, you've got more AUMs used than what you have available. So I'm just gonna back that off a little bit. And especially because it's early in the growing season, it is probably cool season forage, but um, you know, I probably haven't grown all my AOMs yet anyway. I'm gonna say, well, maybe around three weeks is what you might be able to do in there. If you wanna be conservative, you could back it off to two weeks. Um, if you don't think you're gonna have the growth by the first part of June. <laughs> so then the next thing I'm gonna do, I'm just gonna keep kind of going through here and the. The uh, dam pasture is going to be our next pasture. And uh, looks like you'd really be going overboard. I think if you did three, turns it dark red. And I'll show you a feature here in a minute that's going to explain that. So I'm going to come down. It's like towards the end of June, middle of June, I can be in that pasture one. And usually by the 1st of July, we consider that we've sort of grown all our AUMs. So I've probably got peak production out there. Um, so I went over on this pasture, but I barely went over. And so you can see these cells up here, 10% and 5%. So we're, when we're within 5% of our recommended initial stocking rates, it'll just kind of show up this nice light peach color and uh, it says, you know, you're kind of getting over, but when you go over that 5%, it turns to the dark red in the more salmon colored cell. So that says, hey, you need to be careful here. You've really gone over. And as a rule of thumb, we ne never want to go over probably 20% of our initial recommended stocking rates. And once we've gone over 10, then we've we know we've probably got something we should be aware of. So I'm going to back that off. So it's just kind of an early warning sign within the tool. Bring this down and I'm going to see how many AUMs are available. I can see I've got a few more here. And almost right on. So within 5% for sure. And looks like we might be able to get a week out of that crop residue down there. So there's the year one schedule, a deferred rotation with those pastures. And so one thing you can do is you're building grazing schedules. Here we like to build a grazing schedule for at least three years. And so you can go ahead and you can put all these grazing schedules on the same page. So I can create a 2022 schedule here. Got six pastures. And then you can put those pastures in the same sequence that you want. I'm just going to say north pasture is a special early cool season pasture. And then uh, we work here, at least in South Dakota NRCS. We want to change the season of use as much as we can every year. And so usually we can do that if we have. Uh, the right size pastures by kind of taking that uh, first pasture from the year before and making it last. So I'm going to make that first pasture last. We're going to change season to use on this thing. So that dam pasture comes the last pasture. And let's just say uh, we're not going to have any crop residue. 
add in third one again. And then 128 head is what we're planning for once more. And then I can just go through that same process again of assigning AUMs. And, you know, kind of looking at this, you got to use a little bit of user judgment. You know, by the end of May, um, we're probably going to be through maybe at least half of our growth curve. Um, but I'm going to back it off a little bit, just saying we're not going to have those AUMs available yet. And uh, go ahead and just go through the same process again. So there I have two years of a grazing schedule in the weekly grazing schedule tab. And so I would probably add a third one. These tabs really work well. If you print them on legal or 11 by 17 size paper, you can really get a lot of uh, years or a lot of fields into those grazing schedules if you print them that way. Um, so there is a reset print area button. You kind of um, get wonky on the size of the data that you, you put in there or if you really start expanding cells. And then I would also advise you that uh, this tab is really better for just kind of getting a general idea of how long you can be in each of those pastures. You know, the manager on the ground is probably going to be making decisions, hopefully, when to move those livestock kind of based on grazing use and conditions. But you know, larger pastures, larger range units, um, this is a really good option. And it just kind of helps create um, a, a plan from which to work with. But you know, of course, uh, using management judgment along the way. Um, you can clear the weekly schedule too. There is a clear button. So there it is, it's gone. I could start over again. Um, and then of course, there are notes as always you can make certain notes about this grazing schedule or things that might be important according to the producer or the planner and uh, that's the weekly grazing scheduler what i'm going to go through in the south dakota grazing tool is what we call our daily scheduler and that resides just in the tab to the right of the weekly scheduler so i'm going to open that up and this scheduler works pretty much exactly the same way as the weekly scheduler does. The big difference is that instead of allocating grazing use on a weekly basis, we can allocate grazing use on a daily basis. So this is, allows us to really fine tune our planned grazing use and allows us to develop a pretty detailed grazing schedule. And so in a lot of cases, when we would use this form would be on uh, probably smaller pastures that have relatively large numbers of livestock in them, uh, maybe even more management intensive type grazing situations uh, where we've got maybe daily moves or moves that are definitely less than a week in time. So this allows us to get pretty detailed. Um, so I'm just gonna go through and kind of show you how this form works. Um, much like the weekly schedule and the other grazing schedules, there is a place to put notes. Um, if you feel like you need to put notes to make something specifically known about this grazing schedule. Um, as always, you hover over the instruction cell and there'll be some handy tips for completing this form. Um, and again, we are needing to make list. And so this is commonly the button that we would push first in our grazing schedules. So I'm just going to go ahead and push that and bring in those 
fields from our forage inventory sheet. So I'm gonna expand that cell out a little bit so we can see that better. And so there are our pastures. And so once again, I have these Wyoming fields down here at the bottom. I'm gonna get rid of those. We're only working on the South Dakota land units. And uh, I'm gonna go ahead and I'm going to organize these pastures in the sequence that we plan to graze them this year. Start with that north pasture and uh, go to the dam pasture. Range one, range two, range three, and our crop field there is last. And then uh, I put in the year here, 2021. And then if I want to evaluate our grazing use as we develop this, with the green bars here, similarly, similarly to the, uh, the weekly scheduler, uh, I just need to populate this chart year 2021. Again, we have the six colors that correspond to different herds if we have them. And uh, once again, I can build a herd here if I'd like, and uh, I'm not gonna do that though. I'm gonna do this in a little different way, but I could build my own herd like I did in the weekly scheduler and bring it in. But uh, I'm not going to do that. Um, I'm just going to go ahead and I'm going to put in, and we're mostly going to be grazing 1,200 pound cows here. And I think we had about 120 head of those 1,200 pound cows. And uh, so I want to start grazing about the middle of May. So this scheduler is much like the weekly in that it allows us to schedule an entire year of grazing on one sheet. So moving over there. April through March again. But one thing that we have is each of these cells, and I've got April, May, if I look in this cell here, that is day 15. So this cell here will represent the 15th of May. So I'm going to enter a one there because that's going to turn yellow and it's going to represent herd one. So every time I put a one in each of those cells, that is representing one day of grazing by 120 head of 1,200 pound cows. And so my AUMs used will increase correspondingly as I populate each one of those cells. Looks like I have about 120 AUMs available. So it's a lot faster just to go ahead and hover over those cells or select those cells until you can bring up this little square in the lower right hand corner get that plus symbol, and I'm just gonna drag this thing out until, let me see, maybe about the middle of July, or middle of June. That's uh, just a guess. Oh, I went over a little bit there. I'm gonna bring that back. And there's about 117 AUMs that I've used. I've got 120 available. Gets me to about the ninth, but um, it's like, I'm gonna go ahead and just leave it right there. That's our early cool season pasture. And I'm gonna say that's probably about close enough. So I'm gonna go ahead and we're gonna move next to the dam pasture. Again, 120 head of cows, 1200 pounds. And I'm gonna enter ones there. And I'm going to say, well, that's not a very big pasture, so I'm going to just drag those cells out. Now, getting pretty close, 63 AUMs, kind of still early in the grazing season, have 77 available, use 63. Um, I might just add one more, see where that gets me. Yeah, I'm going to go ahead and just stop there. We're just shy of uh, the first part of July. So drop down, bring in those 1,200 pound cows again, get 120 head, and uh, I'm gonna allocate that forage day by day. Again, if I want, I can drag that, or I can just go ahead and I can enter ones into each cell until I have the AUMs used that I'm looking for. Again, just like the weekly scheduler, I'm watching this green bar up here on the top go down so I can kind of see where I'm at. Still have quite a few AUMs left. Um, maybe I'll go ahead and do the trick of dragging that cell with the one in it a little bit to the middle of July, about the 10th there. Still got some AUMs left. 
but I'm going to do something a little different here than I did in the weekly scheduler. I'm going to say that about that time of year, that's when I plan in to, to plan to bring my bulls into the situation. So I'm going to go ahead and put bull mature there. So I have field one range, field one range, because they're both going to be in the same pasture together. And I think I had about eight head of bulls. And so I'm going to start with a two here to show those bulls are using it. But same as at the top, I've got cows using it alongside the bulls. So bring this in. It's taken kind of a long time to do that. Um, I'm going to go and use my, uh, my trick of just dragging those cells out and copying them. Bring it out to here and see where that gets me. Got some more AUMs left there. And that gets me just a little bit over. I think I'll just hover over those, hit the delete key, get back to something closer to a little tighter feed and forage balance. Again, um, the colors show up like in the weekly scheduler. Um, if I'm a little over 5%, it's kind of sort of that soft peach color. Um, but when I get over 10% uh, use above my estimated stocking rates, um, it turns that darker salmon color with the red text. So, I might just push it a little bit, go an extra day there. And uh, there I've got my cow use again drop down. We're going to move to uh, pasture three here. Those 1,200 pound cows, 120 head. Make sure I've got pasture three again because those bulls are still going to be in there for a while. Got my eight head of bulls. And uh, I one for the cows, two for the bulls, gonna show up blue. And I'm just gonna kind of drag this out. Looks like I've got quite a few AUMs in there. It's gonna be about the same carrying capacity as field two, but oh, just a little bit over. Take a few of those off. Yep, there it is. Looks like I about got my feed and forage balance there. And uh, that's looking pretty close there. So that's another way of bringing in animals into the grazing schedule and uh, kind of the best way to use the daily uh, South Dakota grazing tool grazing schedule. Um, once again, I can reset the print range here. Um, of course, I can clear the schedule if I wanna start all over again. Uh, just a word of warning, if you do clear the schedule, uh, you can't get the data back. And then um, I'm not going to do it here, but uh, once again, if I wanted to create a 2022 schedule, um, I could do that here too. Um, but uh, that is how you use the daily grazing scheduler in the South Dakota. All right, so next we're gonna move on to the last grazing schedule type in the South Dakota grazing tool. It's called the in and out scheduler. And so this one has some different features than the weekly and the daily scheduler. And I'm gonna show you how this works. And basically it's set up to be a pretty easy date in, date out type of format. And I'm just gonna stop, start from the top and work to the bottom. And again, there are cells here that have sort of handy tips as you hover over them for each of the cells. Um, I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna build that same herd I did before, but there's a place to put your herds in here so you can kind of describe what they are. So we had 120 cows and eight bulls in that herd. And it'll ask you for the grazing management type if you have one. On this one, I'm going to show you how to do a twice through rotation. Um, I'm going to show you how that will, this tool will actually help you design that rotation based on desired recovery periods. One of the things in the South Dakota prescribed grazing standard that's important are periods of recovery between grazing. So um, you can put notes in here again, as always. 
And then I want to show you something. Uh, there's a cell over here that says important points to understand about this prescribed grazing plan. And the way this thing comes standard is these are sort of the general tenants of prescribed grazing in South Dakota. So generally when we will write a prescribed grazing plan in most cases, unless we've got some other consideration, um, we will write them to be uh, in line with our prescribed grazing standards. So that's what this language is. It talks about recovery periods and utilization levels and um, changing season to use. Um, so let's just tear into this thing. Um, the first thing you wanna do is click the make list button as always to bring in your pastures. And it'll bring in those pastures. I don't want those Wyoming pastures. I'm just gonna delete those right off the top. And we're gonna go ahead and we're just gonna put in here the C sequence as always. So the same sequence. So we're gonna start in the north pasture. We're gonna go to the dam pasture in year one. Range one, two, and three. And we'll end up in that crop field. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to build a herd here. And I've got that same herd, but I can change this if I want to, but I've got those same numbers from the weekly scheduler where we built the herd. It saved that. And so I'm going to go ahead and I'm just going to find herd one. We're going to just roll with herd one as we got it. The number again was 128. And here is where this is a little different. So I want you to notice two things. The first thing is this is only for one year, and that's why I put the 2020 grazing season in there. So this is just one year of grazing use. If you want to do multiple years, the best way to use this tab is to do multiple grazing plans for, for every, just do one per year. You're not going to get two years of grazing or three years of grazing plan on one form with this. So the first thing I need to know is what is my date in? And that's an easy number, 515. Okay. So I can go ahead and I can play with the date out if I wanted to. I go, well, I wonder if this thing will last me till 620. I don't know. No, nope, that's way too long. So it's 11 days over. So it's going to tell me how many days of grazing are available. And it'll tell me as I enter in numbers here, how much am I under or how much am I over? So I'm going to go, okay, well, let's go with six, five. That's going to tell me I have at least four days left. So I can go, okay, six, nine. So there it is. That's perfect. Well, I don't want to deal with that. There is a really handy feature in this tab where I can click on schedule. And it's going to add a new column to this. So it's going to say use that. Use what percent of available days? So let's say I have a twice through rotation. If I have a once through rotation, all I have to do is say I want to use 100 percent of the available days. And it's going to add that date in automatically and perfectly balance me out. Now, early on in the grazing season, I'm probably not going to do that because I'm going to have to consider my growth curve and how much I actually have. But in this, we're going to go through and we're going to use about 40% the first time through, and we're going to go through a second time. So I'll show you how I usually do that. So I'm just going to drop this thing down. And I'm going to get rid of this crop field because that thing is going to be grazed last. And like I said, we're going to do this twice through. So I'm just going to pull this down 40% in every pasture the first time through. Okay, so there's our first time through gets us to about the 2nd of July. Okay, so I want to do basically that same thing. I'm going to try to copy this down. And I'm going to copy numbers, and it's going to start me out July 2nd. I'm coming in the second time. So this is those pastures in sequence over again. But I want to use all of the AUMs that are left, so I'm going to put 100 in there. because so I want to use 100% of the AUMs available that second time through. And as I do that, 
it's going to fill in the date in and the date out for each of those pastures. And one thing that's kind of cool is it's going to give me the recovery period in days for each of those pastures. So you can see how many days of recovery we actually got since the time we grazed it before. So that's pretty cool and pretty handy. And then down here I had that crop field. And um, I'm just going to say I want to use 100% of that. It's going to say, hey, you can graze that thing for six days. You're probably going to be out of there by the 18th of September. Obviously, there's no recovery days because we've only grazed it once. And that is a really handy, easy way to use the scheduler in and out. Um, one of the reasons this form was designed is some of our clients liked looking at something that actually had dates in there. They found it easier to use in some cases than spreadsheets that have the colored cells, which create bars across the grazing use. So this is just kind of an alternative way to design a grazing plan. And then there's another handy feature here. You can actually print this out and you can put your applied actual grazing use records into this sheet and kind of compare what you planned to what you actually did. So it's kind of a nice evaluation side by side of how your grazing plan worked that year. And if you were able to either kind of follow the plan or if you had to deviate from it for whatever reason. So that's a quick and easy way to use the in and out scheduler within the South Dakota grazing plan. All right, so the last tab that I'm gonna show you in the South Dakota grazing tool is the CPA 16 actual grazing use records tab. So what this allows you to do is enter in your actual use grazing records and compare them to the your use to the AUMs available. And also this form is basically what South Dakota NRCS uses to certify prescribed grazing. So once again, I'm going to click the make list button. And I want to make sure I have the right grazing year in. So I'm going to enter 2021 there. Put whatever you want in there. It could be 2020's records. And so it's going to bring in all your pastures. I don't want anything to do with those Wyoming fields again. So I'm just going to go ahead and it's better to put them in in the actual sequence that they were grazed. So I'm going to change that using the drop down button once again. One, two, and three, and then that crop field. And then it's going to ask me for the animal kind. If I just want to throw herd one in there, I can. Because it's still available to me. Or I can just put in 1,200 pound cows, 1,300 pound cows, whatever I got in my animal inventory. Just going to do that for all of them. And then we had 128 was roughly where we were on those. Actually, let's just say, hey, we were we ended up with a, more like 133. OK, so I've got that side in there, the actual use for the animals. Then I'm going to come over here and it allows you to drop down on this side all those fields. And what I like to do is I like those to be in the same order up above on the horizontal side of this as I do the vertical side. So I'm going to go north pasture, put the dam pasture in here next. I want them to be in the same order. It's just, it, it really makes a lot more sense when you do that. Range, range two, south range three. And you can see some of those are cut off, but you can actually see the names up here in the formula bar. And then here, I'm going to put that crop field in here. It left in those Wyoming fields because those are in our forage inventory. I'm just going to delete those out of there for simple use. Then I'm going to come down here 
and it gives me the option to put in a date in and a date out. So I'm going to say, yep, we started on 515. Uh, we were in there until about 615. And it's going to calculate the AUMs used and the days grazed, and it looks like we went over on that field. So we were a little bit high there. So um, it gives us that same sort of salmon color, dark salmon color in this case, it's because we went over than over 10% of our estimated recommended stocking rate in that past year. So we kind of went overboard on that. And you're gonna see here, it's gonna have an option for degree of use. So you can put in a percent utilization there at the end of the season or rema remaining leaf length at the end of the grazing period or season. So I'm just going to go ahead and I'm going to say, oh man, we kind of overdid it. We ended up with over 50% utilization there. And then let's just keep going. Then I want to show you that you just, you start with the day that you ended. So it's going to cut those days in half for use. So you don't have to put 616 in there. You put 615 in there again. And I'm going to say we were in there until about 630. That was almost right on the money. So here it says we had 77 AUM suggested from our forage inventory. We used about 75.1. So let's say that one was 45% utilization. Just keep going through the south range. We're out of there by 728. Went over a little bit on that one. Under a little bit on that next field, range two. Went over, and then let's take a look at that crop field. Went over a little bit on that one too, but pretty close. And then, um, Fill the rest of this in. If you want to go with inches of grass left behind, that's an option too. Utilization. So it just kind of gives you a comparison of the animal, the AUMs used to the AUMs that were suggested to be available from the forage inventory tab. And so this is a handy way to go ahead and enter those records and kind of do an evaluation. Now, one of the things that's kind of nice, if you have one grazing tool that's set up for your ranch or for a client that you're working with, you can just click this Save Current Year's Data button. This will clear the 16 and make it ready for next year, but it will go ahead and it will archive that data. And so we'll be able to access 2021's grazing schedule. So I'm going to show you how that works. Click that. It's going to archive the data. It's taken a few minutes for it to do this on my laptop, and there it goes. It came back to me. Then I'm just going to go to this archive tab directly to the right. It's going to give me the option to bring in the 2021 grazing season. And there it is. So you can archive multiple years of grazing records within the South Dakota grazing tool. South Dakota grazing record tab is ready to take on 2020's grazing records. So that's a quick overview of the actual use grazing records tab within the South Dakota grazing tool. All right, thanks for watching our video. If you have additional comments or questions, our contact information will be listed on the following screen.